Welcome back, everybody, to Founders Forum Health Tech 2020 at London Tech Week Connects. Um, it is an exciting next session for me with a dear friend of mine, a global health uh, physician and photographer, one of the first, if not only in the world, of his ilk, uh, Dr. Alex Kumar. Before we do go into this session entitled No More Ivory Towers, a look into neglected diseases, including viral um, epidemics, pandemics, and so on, in the countries which we normally ignore, uh, and lessons we can learn from that, we're going to play for you something which is a very important clip. Um, it was, it was voiceovered uh, and uh, written by a dear friend of mine, um, my mentor uh, and um, person who has guided me through my career uh, as a physician. His name is uh, Professor Hugh Montgomery. He was supposed to also be with us today uh, to talk about uh, how we're dealing with this uh, closer to home um, as, a, as, as a viral pandemic. Very sadly, um, through personal family tragedy um, of uh, untold pain. Uh, um, Professor Hugh Montgomery is sadly unable to be with us today. Uh, but I thought we would be right still to share with you um, the very nature of what he cares about most, which is humans, but not only the humans that he treats, the, the, his fellow colleagues um, who are critical uh, to us uh, when our bodies cannot keep themselves alive. So let us play uh, what I think is a remarkable piece um, of audio, and um, uh, hopefully we will get a sense of what it's like to be a critical care physician. The sustained and relentless emotional pressure faced by every intensive care worker today is beyond anything we have ever known or could have imagined. And yet these workers come back every day and start again, doing their best for their patients and trying to be positive. We've just lost one of our nurses that work at the hospital. Just a bit emotional. So it's quite tough uh, coming back to a lonely hotel room every day. We've had some deaths. It's very hard for the nursing staff. It does feel very, very worrying and, and, and very surreal right now at the moment, hoping that I can cope with the, the pressures of ICU. We had a patient that died of uh, COVID-19 and his wife died of COVID-19 two days before. So there's a brother and sister today that woke up without both parents and I'm just thinking about them. It must be awful for the families and it's pretty awful for us as well. It was just completely spinning plates all day and it's just uh, this endless conveyor belt of problems to deal with. I'm seriously worried about the toll on the staff and what that means for the future of intensive care. I can't sleep anymore and all I can hear is like the alarms at work. <laughs> constantly in my head, constantly hear the phones ringing, the ventilators going off. In our lifetimes, one in six of us will require admission into intensive care. In the current crisis, one in 10 patients with COVID-19 need intensive care treatment. For now and for our futures, help us to provide care for those who care for us. I think we can all agree that um, critical care is one of the most important things that we have. Um, our heart goes out to Hugh at this time, at this very uh, challenging moment for him and his family, uh, but thank him and all uh, um, of our frontliners for the work that they're doing and continue to do putting themselves um, at risk. But of course, uh, we, we, we live in a fairly privileged world as well. In rich countries, uh, we do have intensive care beds. We rarely run out of them. Uh, what about the countries where there are none at all? Um, and to talk about this and the fact that we are also not immune um, to uh, shortages of, of beds and medicines and people that we need um, is my, my, my friend, uh, Dr. Alex Kumar, who I shall briefly introduce through our history. Um, we met uh, halfway up a mountain, literally him hanging down a, a glacial, a, a, a glacial uh, crevasse uh, as I was examining him on the Diploma of Mountain Medicine finals. Uh, where he had forgotten to do his shoelaces up. 
which shows that even the greatest uh, minds and, and bravest people can sometimes uh, not be 100% perfect. Um, and uh, we, we became great friends. Um, and uh, over the last uh, several years, worked on various projects together. But, but Alex is a remarkable individual. He is, I believe, uh, the first, if not uh, uh, only, um, practicing global health physician and also a professional photographer. Um, he has uh, traveled literally uh, everywhere around the world, uh, takes a particular interest in health inequalities and most importantly around health inequalities in transmissible diseases uh, not just viruses but also bacterial and, uh, and and parasitic that that do cripple the countries we often neglect they are the diseases that are neglected they are in and amongst the people who we often neglect uh, and yet a lot of what alex has observed photographed communicated and observed over the last 10 or so years um, are just the lessons that have been learned locally that we should have really learned uh, and been prepared for ourselves which could possibly have helped us uh, manage this a lot better and a lot quicker so a lot of relevance um, to for, from the developing world uh, into rich countries. Um, uh, Alex, a very, a very, very warm welcome to you. Um, I just wonder, before we have uh, our, our chat, um, tell us a little bit about what you've been up to in the last three months. So it's been a difficult time for everyone. I've uh, kept myself busy with the clinical work. So I'm actually a, a part-time uh, primary care GP training doctor now, uh, focusing on global primary care with a background of global health. But yes, I've split my time between clinics, helping uh, South London's population, and then also uh, in a management leadership position, helping to orchestrate and run the Nightingale Hospital as a very tiny piece of that large machine that was set up ultra fast. Um, well, and, and and thank you, by the way, for also working every hour that uh, that, that God sends uh, for 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 that work. Uh, it was brilliant vol volunteering. Um, and uh, what what I'd like to do is is not sort of talk about your your London work, uh, but talk about your global work. So um, perhaps we can uh, show some slides uh, of, of some of your of some of your brilliant travels. Um, uh, have we have we got have we got the slides up and running? Are they going? Uh, we're, we, we have. Excellent. OK. Uh, I, I can't see them, unfortunately. I hope everyone else can. Um, so, Alex, do, do you want to talk do you want to talk through uh, some of your travels uh, and some of the work which you've done observing transmissible diseases and what you've learned from them? Yeah, so um, people move more now than they ever have in humanity. We, we migrate more than birds and move more than any other animal or insect on the planet for that matter. And we've really taken a prime position in moving over, over the last uh, century, in, in fact. And we've moved disease and COVID is a brilliant example of how that's moved. But COVID is just the tip of the iceberg and even COVID has a huge amount below the surface we haven't yet discovered. But I've been very privileged prior to uh, settling in London. I was very unsettled and moved around the world chasing infectious diseases and outbreaks ranging from Zika to Ebola to other, other diseases, but also looking at neglected tropical diseases. But I've been very fortunate to, uh, to walk among some of the world's most needing populations and, uh, and really try and get a hold on what, what makes the world tick in terms of healthcare and health systems. So Al, sh should, we, should we walk through some of your favourite photographs of some of the great moments um, that you've uh, witnessed in, in global health? Yeah, unfortunately, I can't see the slides myself now, but um, Neither can I. <laughs> there was a slide um, after the uh, after the uh, planes moving around that showed actually a, a famous photograph taken by Kevin Carter. And that's of a, uh, a, a child sat in the desert with a vulture looking at it. And the, the area of photography I've done and developed, which is global health photography, is pointing a camera at some of the world's hardest and most significant problems you know, ethically quite questionable at times, but really important. And, um, you know, that work has taken me all around the world. And now, you know, the next slide is is looking at, you know, the waste the resources and what a privilege it is to have so much access to healthcare and what a great health system we have. You know, everyone's appreciated the NHS and as they've appreciated their own health structure, but there's a lot of countries that have left been left really in trouble without much. And so I'll walk through some of those. 
Um, oh, before you before you do, I'm I'm just interested to uh, uh, pause for a second on um, on waste. Um, so we 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 throw away things that could be sterilized. Um, is is that something that is is actually necessary? Do do we have to throw so much stuff away, or can we reuse things? Uh, no, it's complete. A lot of things now can be manufactured. We are the masters of manufacturing in terms of the industrial revolution. Beyond that, we 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 can work with new materials from anything out of a spider and a spider's web and studying that and replicating that through to new sterilization techniques. So there's really no reason to be wasting as much as we do. If you think as you walk through a clinic or hospital, whether it be in the UK or abroad, how much is deposited in waste in that and then also just equipment as well how much is thrown away which actually should be built to be re-sterilized and reused actually the whole sustainability movement is so important especially in relation to healthcare thanks Al. should, should we move on to your work in in, in ebola so yeah, the photograph there shows a fist bump of uh, me with a child who actually was infected with Ebola. So I'm in full PPE and actually the child is not wearing any PPE because he is infected, but yet still got a great antibody immunity to the disease. So he's, he's still carrying it, but fighting it and has fought it, but just waiting to clear it. So he was helping me go around in Sierra Leone during the great Ebola outbreak in West Africa there in 2015-16. And that was a massive outbreak. We'll never see anything like it again, but it really you know, thrust the, uh, the image of this great African disease. And of course, it came out of Central Africa. Uh, just, just break out, out of control in three countries in West Africa, which were new to the disease. And the lessons there were on the following slide shows a, uh, an element which I find really intriguing. And that's the slide which shows all the beds with all the you know, Afro-Caribbean people, patients in, and then one white person in bed in the middle of that with all the cameras pointing around that white person. And actually, for the thousands, tens of thousands of deaths due to Ebola in West Africa, actually the publicity, the PR, the media storm was all focused and on, on solving the problem for, for uh, those who come in from America or from the UK or from abroad, on essentially white people. And actually, I think there was a huge inequality in the way we also document and portray these diseases. And that's well, true of COVID as well. In, in, indeed, a lot of diseases are not even tested on, on, on folk except for you know, no, 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 Northern European and American um, genotypes. So it's uh, yeah, a very, very, very important lesson learned. And I think clearly a, a huge topic that's come to the fore um, in, in the last couple of weeks, of course. Um, but things that we've known about and seem to you know, continually rear their heads and not really address perhaps the fact that these issues are now universal and global will change our minds a little bit about them, oh, one would hope. Um, should, we move on to, should we move on to your work in India? Uh, yes. So, uh, well, actually, before that, I mean, lower middle income countries uh, alongside India is Bangladesh. And actually, I took this photograph, which shows a view just through the front doors of a hospital ward in Bangladesh. And actually, if, if, the, if, the, if the viewers can actually just imagine what their own hospital at home looks like, the, this view really represents, you know, a peer into the problems that a lot of countries uh, have. And that moves on to Zika virus. And Zika, alongside Ebola, was one of the big outbreaks of the last 10 years. Um, it's not a new virus. It hasn't come out of nowhere like COVID has. We've known about it since 1950s, where its correct pronunciation is Zika, and it came out of a Ugandan forest. Um, but the work I did there in Brazil and the uh, elements there, there's a photograph of the children pointing at a rubber tire, upturned rubber tire that's cut in half. And actually that's there to collect water for them to put on their garden plants. But unfortunately with Zika, that's a prime breeding ground for the mosquito Aedes, which spreads Zika. And so without knowing it, one on the one hand trying to survive, but on the other leaving themselves completely susceptible to what is an unfair disease. Um, Al, uh, it, it was it was very interesting how um, you, you talked before about you, you know the, the the American traveler being very worried and um, and and all the attention going towards them, but in fact where the problem was worst was really being ignored, or rather in whom the uh, in the populations being affected worst, almost you know being as neglected as the disease itself. Uh, I, th I think that the slide with the mother holding the child with microencephaly was um, really, I mean, that was one of my 
uh, were one of the photographs you took that moved me the most. Um, of course, we we worried about that an awful lot uh, when perhaps um, it wasn't so much to uh, c concern people in southern Texas, for instance, where there was just as much of it um, as in uh, as in certain other places. Um, what what are what are what are, what is the importance um, of us actually spending the money uh, to look at these diseases, see how they spread, and learn how to prevent them from spreading. Um, clearly, you know, certain people are removing budgets from the World Health Organization and so on at critical times like this. Um, this, is, this is a silly question. Should we be reducing budgets or increasing them? Clearly we should. But where should we be putting that extra effort at that extra funding? Well, so going back, it's a great question. And going back to that mother and child, that, that image of uh, uh, the real image of the cliche of Zika almost is that, you know, that child has not died. Ebola would just wipe out an entire town, an entire village, an entire population, and then people would rebuild and move on. The thing with Zika is, and to, sorry to use the term, but it cripples a population. And I say that in terms of um, it, it strips them down and leaves them susceptible to problems way into the future. This is not a short-term problem. In fact, that child pictured there with a small brain will need huge amounts of neuro rehabilitation. They'll never reach their potential. It was stolen away by a simple mosquito bite. And um, unfortunately, it's a long-term neurological deficit, a problem. And that requires a huge amount of funding. The problem is, is when you point a camera and put it front page of the New York Times, Medicine Sans Frontières and uh, the Red Cross and everyone moves in and uh, the media ignites. It's as quick as pouring petrol on a fire and that burns out. And the unfortunate thing is viruses, bacteria, parasites, they don't stop. They carry on. And mm. so the funding has to carry on for that as well. And that mm. brings on beautifully to the next slide, which is about resistance and about antimicrobial resistance. And this, this is a black and white photograph with a desperate scene. A, a, a semi-intensive care, but intensive care didn't ex really exist in this particular place. And it was a high dependency unit. So family members squeezing bags of life, bags of intravenous fluid into their family member who had a drug resistant, an antimicrobial resistant, antibiotic resistant sepsis. And I found him at 10 a.m. amongst a sea of patients with a high temperature using a temperature gun going next person to next person in Bangladesh. And by 7 p.m. he passed away, sadly. And that's because of antimicrobial antibiotic resistance. Um, and, and you mentioned that this is this is the example of critical care in some in, 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 in let, let's face it, actually, the majority of the world. Yeah. And, you know, we can, you know, it, it's a shame Professor Hugh Montgomery couldn't be with us. And I'm very saddened to hear of his, his uh, loss there. And, but he is an expert in this area. And he, in his lifetime, has seen from zero resistance to our new antibiotics this century to, you know, 50% of patients in ICU having some form of drug resistant, antibiotic resistant infection. It makes you think in the next lifetime, or in our, at the end of our careers, maybe we'll be seeing higher, and these rates are increasing. The next slide I'd, I have is of a black and white um, photograph I took in Cambodia, and it's particularly symbolic. This is an area of Cambodia on the border, whereby a, a man is sat beneath a mosquito net, the, the shot is through a mosquito net. And that's to say, he's got a rare type and it's becoming less rare more common now but a type of drug resistant malaria so to cut a long story short there was a roadside plant that's now found in china it's called artemisia annua that in chinese medicine was used to be treating fevers a nobel prize was won for its discovery in the adaptation of artemisinine the active ingredient inside it as a new treatment at the turn of the 2000 to as a new treatment for malaria we now have resistance to that drug. That's how fast things move. Bacteria, mycobacteria, small bacteria, parasites as well, and viruses. These things can adapt against the very weapons we form. We go to sleep at night, these things propagate and replicate and multiply while we're sleeping. We, we, we um, unfortunately um, have to move on uh, to, to the next part of uh, our conversation. But before we do um, about your experience of isolation, let's just uh, skim through some of these award winning photographs um, and then we'll talk about your experience of Antarctica. 
So the next photograph shows I uh, took on the Thai, Thailand, Myanmar border, and it was a, a DFID, a Department of, for International Development funded project with um, the Wellcome Trust, and that's uh, showing TB, drug resistant TB, so tuberculosis. This is an age old disease. It's nothing is new about this disease. We've known about it forever. However, the uh, problem is resistance. And this child had sought, had moved a huge amount of distance, crossing an international boundary, you know, a political boundary, a geopolitical boundary in order to seek treatment. But the treatment requires three to six months as an inpatient. You can't leave. So this was at the end of their trip, looking to go home, having had treatment, but one of the battles. Then another photograph shows a man being dragged on a board by his brother. And this man had polio. And polio isn't another terror story. It's not one to help get funding and, and, and to put there on the media to scare people or to uh, scaremonger. It's actually a success story. Polio is very similar to coronavirus for a lot of reasons. And most importantly, it can be spread asymptomatically as well in the, in the shortly after infection. But this shows a real disability, the impairment that this person suffered. They can't work. You know, they've just literally been contaminated with a infectious disease that's part of their social environment. And so there's the inequality. We turn on the taps at home, we get clean water. But in these countries, you know, you can pick up polio. So that's that. And that moves me on to the very quickly to the last point, which is about snake bite. And snake bite is a great example of a neglected tropical disease. These are 20 diseases that impact the last 2 billion people on the planet. These are people right at the back, right at the bottom of the pile, and where they include things like schistosomiasis, bilharzia, dengue fever, and snake bite. And these are the problems that are going to become more neglected. How does an ordinarily neglected tropical disease become more neglected? Maybe we should be reclassifying diseases as more neglected diseases. But that's what's going to happen now as funding, uh, funding's cut. Yeah. And indeed, I think we're actually seeing even fit big ticket items like cancer being neglected uh, when priorities like this happen. Um, to round up, um, I'm going to talk about uh, Antarctica with you. <laughs> um, we've all experienced a period of isolation um, in, the, in the last three months. Uh, you decided to experience 12 months of it voluntarily, including six months of complete darkness in Antarctica. I, I actually think I hold the world record for having my foot on feet on the con on that continent for the shortest number of minutes in the world. Uh, I think it was uh, ju just shy of four hours. Um, and, and you spent 12 months there. Um, what did you learn about isolation and and what is isolation really in the context of some of these poor patients these two billion people who are in almost constant isolation because of the taboo around their infections well like you started off jack we all make mistakes whether it's forgetting to tie our shoelaces up or not knowing how to tie them up um, when you're up a mountain or choosing to spend 12 months in isolation in, in antarctica so as a team of 13, I'm working with the European Space Agency to study the effects on human psychology and physiology towards sending people to Mars, which at the current technology and rate, depending on the elliptical orbit, would take probably three to six months to get there. So uh, you're wanting a round trip as well with some time there, albeit more than four hours like yours in Antarctica. But the serious nature of isolation is uh, it, it's really significant. Its impact is massive on, on, on the psyche. Um, it's what stress, which is what, what it can induce, which actually is a positive thing. It's, it brings about positive responses. It's the very reason why we fear tigers and so forth. Uh, you know, saber-toothed tigers, it's all evolved from that. But actually, poor people you know, existing in flats, albeit in southeast London, for example, packed in without any reprise, without any garden, without any outside light. It's very comparable to living in the Antarctic winter in many ways. Um, you are stuck inside, you can't go out, and you're not uh, in the environment that I was in with three months of darkness, but it's a different type of darkness. It's a psychological one, and actually people struggle. Isolation is dangerous. It's not a great thing to have. And, you know, when you look at solitude and things like that, there was a positive effect towards being happy and spending time alone but this is not by choice this is almost like imprisonment um uh, al um what is the one thing that you want us to have learned in the past and perhaps hope we will now learn uh in the very near future uh, regarding um pandemics uh, transmissible diseases 
So the last slide summarizes it perfectly, which is a slide taken on the beach in Zanzibar where I just pointed the camera up and saw three seaweed collectors collecting seaweed for salary, um, walking along the beach, three locals, uh, and then a uh, slightly overweight English man in the background in sunglasses walking out to the sea. And I think if there's ever a sense of disparity, the social determinants of health, some housing to, to the, all the community services that exist, Funding is a massive issue, but also the true sense of community and, and equality that COVID has shown. We need to work together, be positive and find solutions together. And I think by that, that would be my last point. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Al, it's uh, a, a real honour that you have taken time out of your day to share that those amazing experiences. You, you yourself have come back stepping off a plane into my home with weird rashes on your legs saying, oh, I'm sure it's something or other uh, with a weird long name and not being at all bothered about it whilst I was freaking out. Um, and, uh, you know, have put yourself at risk many times to study this, but not just the science of it and to sequence the genes of things like Zika, uh, but also uh, to help us see what the real human reality of it is, not just at the time of infection, but I think very importantly, you also say long term. Uh, towards the impact on communities um, and uh, and so forth. So so I, I really 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 hope that some of your work uh, will be taken uh, globally um, uh, as as a as an example uh, of what we should be learning and thinking about uh, as we uh, prepare. I think for the next um, uh, inevitable pandemic um, that we will face in our lifetime. So thank you very much, Alex. Um, so um, to uh, to to just wrap up, we are going to uh, now take a short networking break, and we'll be back in about five ten minutes. Um, and we'll be hosted uh, by our partners and sponsors, uh, Havas Health and You. Um, and we're going to be looking at music uh, and the powers that it can evoke, uh, both to for an immediate sense of belonging. Um, and to create empathy between people, but also more importantly, actually heal. So I'm very much looking forward to the next session um, and see you in about 10 minutes time.